Poster number 11, white blood cell and platelet trends after splenectomy, being presented by Ali Ardistani. Hi, good afternoon. I would like to thank the sages for the honor of the podium and giving us the opportunity to present our study on white blood cell and platelet count trend after splenectomy. I have nothing to disclose. There is a physiologic increase in white blood cell and platelet counts after splenectomy. This phenomenon makes interpretation of postoperative lab values very difficult, and there is limited literature, especially on elective splenectomy, on this topic. Therefore, we set out to uh, analyze our data and uh, find correlation between the platelet and white blood cell count and uh, probability of uh, develop complications. We included 251 patients who had undergone elective splenectomy over a period of 10 years in our institution. 70 had a lab procedure and 181 had an open procedure. In terms of outcomes, patients with the lab procedure uh, had significantly lower blood loss, of a longer operative time, shorter length of stay, and significantly higher uh, complication rate and infection rate. There was no significant in, uh, <coughs> difference in terms of thermobolic events and mortality rate between the groups. To minimize the variation at baseline in white blood cell count due to underlying hematologic diseases, we used the white blood cell count <coughs> ratio. Uh, this, which was calculated by dividing each postoperative day white blood cell count by the immediate postoperative white blood cell count on postop day zero. As you can observe, there's a distinctive and significant uh, difference between the patient who had developed the complication versus those who didn't. And uh, we observed very similar pattern in patients who had a lab versus open procedure, especially on postoperative one and two. We also looked at patients who uh, had a platelet count of more than a million per microliter, and these patients um, had a 8.6 time higher risk of developing a thromboembolic event. In conclusion, a rising postoperative uh, white blood cell count, especially at postoperative two and three, is concerning for complication and uh, warrants further investigation. And also, patients with a uh, platelet count more than a million uh, are. A, increased risk of developing a thromboembolic event and are candidates for uh, enhanced DVT to prophylaxis. Thank you. What have you done for enhanced prophylaxis? What do you do differently? Uh, we have a program uh, which we are expanding, with, uh, which includes 30 day of postoperative level knocks for uh, patients. Which started with the, our cancer patients, now it included some of our um, high-risk obesity patients, and we think these groups uh, will also be candidates for that program. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Just Poster number 12, umbilical hernias, the cost of waiting, being presented by Dr. Matthew Pittman. I'd like to thank Sages and the chairs for the opportunity to present. My name is Matthew Pittman from The Ohio State University, and I'll be presenting umbilical hernias, the cost of waiting. Um, I have two disclosures. Uh, the first uh, is the uh, senior author uh, is a consultant for Covidian, and access to the Truven database was gifted from Covidian. Uh, these are not a conflict of interest, though. Um, umbilical hernias are well described in the literature, but their impact on healthcare cost work absenteeism, and resource utilization is less well understood. Often asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic hernias are offered watchful waiting. We performed a retrospective review of prospectively gather, uh, gathered data from the Truven database to determine the long-term cost to both the patients and the healthcare system as a whole. The database was compiled, compiled from 479 employers and 3,000 plus hospitals. We began by taking all patients aged 18 to 64 who had an ICD-9 code uh, for umbilical hernia. We then selected out any patients that uh, weren't followed for at least 12 uh, months before and after that index date. We deleted out any other patients that had any outlier costs and eventually ended up with uh, an end of 14,990 for our no surgery group 
and 15,427 for our surgery group. Though there were multiple statistically significant differences in the groups uh, due almost entirely to our large sample size, the only clinically relevant uh, difference was the uh, higher proportion of females uh, in the no surgery group. Uh, in our post-index uh, analysis at uh, 365 days, uh, we did find a higher financial cost for the surgery group, although, so, although those costs were due almost entirely to the procedure itself, and the difference between the groups uh, diminished over time. We found significantly higher number of ER visits and estimated days off in the no surgery group, uh, and probably most strikingly found an increased uh, two plus uh, office visits per day in the group that did not have surgical intervention. So in conclusion, we reviewed what we believe to be the largest umbilical hernia database uh, to date to determine the cost of non-surgical management. Um, in our short-term follow-up, the financial costs were higher in the surgery group, um, but the majority of these costs were due to the surgery itself and the difference diminished over time. We predict that with longer follow-up, the no-surgery group will eventually surpass the surgery group in terms of financial costs. Furthermore, significantly higher uh, days of healthcare utilization and estimated days off were experienced in the no-surgery group. Uh, from our findings, we are recommending early operative intervention for all umbilical hernias. Thanks. Can you just clarify, were the two plus visits in the non-operative group specifically related to the umbilical hernia, or was that every go? Because I, I would look at it and say, oh, it's a bunch of females, and they all got pregnant. <laughs> their belly wall stretched out. They got a belly button hernia. They weren't going to get it fixed. They had to finish their prenatal visits. Sure. That's my office. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So they weren't specifically for the hernia, but things like pregnancy that were in the 12 months prior to or after, those patients were all eliminated initially if they had any outlier costs, major outlier costs, significant comorbidities that caused readmissions, um, pregnancy, and such. So it wouldn't have been within 12 months on either side of their diagnosis state. I think this is a great study, and I think you guys did a wonderful job, and it's very interesting, you know, figuring out costs from charges and all of these words that are not interchangeable but used interchangeably. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about how you determined cost, how you guys, did you use payment as a surrogate marker for cost, or how did, how did you determine what actually constituted cost rather than a charge? Okay, so uh, cost was actually... So cost was listed, um, uh, I'm sorry, I think, so the actual financial cost. Right, so what, what did, how do you define cost? Okay, so cost was in uh, the, the billing to the patient, the charges. Okay, so charges and cost are two very, very different things because we all have charge masters, you know, sure. that kind of go on. But I saw that you were using payments, so my guess is you were using the payment sorry, to the, the physician, yeah, right? Correct, it's probably the payment a surrogate. Back. Right, is right, that, yes, That yes. was a surrogate marker? Correct. Oh, that's great. I mean, this is really needed, so thank you very much. Absolutely. Any other questions? Nothing for a moment. Thank, Thank you. you.